Aloha, everyone out there in radio, television, and internet land. I'm Jason Schwartz, your host of The Neutral Zone, MauiNeutralZone.com. We are on Akaku, Maui Community Television. We are on Radio 88.5 FM, the voice of Maui. And on the internet, we live on YouTube. And so you'll be able to look in YouTube or go to MauiNeutralZone.com and you'll be able to see all the shows. I have a very special guest today, someone that I think some of you voters know, and you'll really be excited. This is Netra Halperin. Aloha and welcome to the show. Aloha, Jason. Thanks for having me and thanks for doing this. Thanks for uh, promoting or getting uh, the um, platform of the candidates out because that's really important so that people aren't, you know, relying on just name but they actually know what the, what the candidates believe and plan. And so thank you for doing this educational well, series. And I think it's more than those three minute deals we get from the TV station where, you know, if you, someone's watching 80 candidates at three minutes each, they, yeah. after getting dizzy, you hope that someone actually looks to see who they are a little bit right. past the three minute mode zone. You know? Right. 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 So now you've been here in Maui and you ran for, council before i know but you were out there you've been a very significant vocal force on maui why are you running this time and why did you choose the state house there in district 11 uh, i'm very concerned about the direction our country is taking um the um inflation uh and then the coming recession is going to be really hard on the people of Maui and the people in my district or many of the people in my district. It's uh, Maui is becoming a two tier society. Um, those who have and those who don't. And many are gonna, many people are gonna have to leave Maui due to the high cost of housing. The, the cost in general, but it's really housing that is it's people start paying well over 50% of their monthly income in their rent, and that is wrong. So I wanted to be there to help during this time. Now, District 11 is Kihei, Wailea, McKenna, that whole area. That's um, correct, yes. Because you're running a state race, I almost have to ask, although I don't know what you can do. What are we gonna do about the traffic situation in Kihei? Have any visions of where you might be able to help in that? Well, regarding the new high school, which is, of course, the biggest traffic issue that's ongoing right now, I am definitely concerned that they put in a roundabout on a highway. I don't think that's appropriate. I think the roundabout on the lowest street in Kihei is great. I think it, in Maui Lani it's great. But I believe they should have put a traffic light and a pedestrian overpass. These are kids. These are children, teenagers. And to expect them to navigate a traffic circle of cars going at high speed. And then I heard one argument is, well, it'll slow traffic down. Well, those who are driving to and from Kihei every day don't want that either. But the kids need to be able to just saunter across an overpass at their leisure and not be stressed and in fear for their life. Well, I know it it's this is late in, what do you say late in the game to change that one yes. they even have a traffic light there so it looks like a traffic light and a roundabout is what we've got coming up and i i think they're thinking about going under the highway rather than over the highway i just know that it better be safe before they open it for bodies to be anywhere near there uh i'm amazed though one of the people in the state government said well this is what they call top down that yes. they make a decision yes. but they didn't do enough conversation locally to know what they're doing so that's what i hope you would be that local force because you, you are a force you're a very powerful yeah. woman well thank you jason and and yes that is i pride myself on being somebody who doesn't take no for an answer when it's a legitimate justified uh justice issue. And this is, this is about children's lives. Um, to have a traffic circle and a traffic light. Now, the thing about the uh, underpass, that's apparently going to go through, I think it's Waipulani Ditch. So this is a ditch that was created uh, for flooding. 
to, to um, have a place for the water to go during flooding. So first of all, that's a good reason not to do it. But even more importantly, and across the nation, this is known, underpasses are places where stuff happens that shouldn't because it's out of sight. Drug deals, assaults, et cetera. So an underpass is not safe. We need a regular catwalk type pedestrian overpass. I, I agree. We'll see where that all plays out. I don't know how they come to change something that is so uh, so in the books, but I'm sure that if the community says no, something's going to stop it. I and I do, I, I do plan to have a meeting with um, Hallie Maxwell, the principal of the new school this week, and I'll get more information on what the status of everything is. And if she doesn't know the exact details, maybe she'll, you know, refer me to the transportation department. But either way, I'm going to start investigating this and see where it's at, what's going on, if anything can be changed, you know, because, you know, when I'm, if I'm elected, when I'm elected in November, that's kind of, that's even months from now. So yeah, I'm, I'm working on that and advocating for the safety of children. What other issues are on your hot list? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you deal with everything and you have the aptitude to pivot, which is really a powerful thing. You're, you're not fixed, but I'm just curious, what are your hot buttons? Things that you know you'd like to be working on. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, the other thing, of course, as I said, is affordable housing. Um, there's many aspects of the housing crisis that are out of our control. Uh, you know, the fact that all the lockdowns created uh, work at home, then many IT professionals are moving to Maui uh, because now they can work from home. Um, but they have a lot bigger salaries than most Maui people do. So they can afford to buy real estate and then they can afford to rent at a much higher amount. And that is making our uh, rent prices almost double. I mean, it's, it's just insane. Uh, but the one thing that the, the county actually does have total control over is the permitting department. Uh, Maui has a glacial pace permitting for building permits. So for smaller things, electrical, plumbing, they're, they're okay. But as far as for the building permits, they route them to these other agencies, uh, flood development, uh, SMA special management area, historical preservation. And those agencies are way, 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 way backed up. For instance, SMA, and that is actually handled by the state. The person uh, handling those, processing those told me he had 80 applications in his queue. And that's ridiculous. I mean, you, so it took six months to get an SMA uh, permit to, uh, for this is for a client because my business is I'm a um, permitting consultant. So that's my job is to help people get permits with Maui County. So my, my client had just a, an Ohana that was, um, I don't know, a quarter mile from the ocean uh, that had been built 10 years ago. I mean, it was all so not related to the ocean. It was so not related. And, and I understand that there's a reason to have those permits, but if they're gonna hold everything up, time is money. So if for a homeowner to buy a, a land a lot or a renovation a property and have to spend a year and a half, that costs money. Most people can't afford to pay for the home they're building and the home they're living in for a long period of time. I mean, there's the building time that just does take time, but to the permitting process, is making a problem. So that costs money. And developers, when they buy a lot and then they have to get new zoning and then they have to get permits to build, they're going to pass on the cost of carrying that property, carrying those loans all that time. And that's going to pass on to the cost of the home. And also because of this, there's very few homes that are being built. Not well, there's, there's a lot of luxury homes, but not very many affordable housing homes. And that is the other problem. And I did talk to a developer about it. And he said, you know, we are happy to build affordable housing. And we don't even need a profit, but we do need our costs covered. We cannot be taking money out of our pockets to pay for our employees 
and the increased exorbitant rate in materials. Everything, all the costs are going up. So that is what should be done is affordable housing should be created. And, and one more thing on that issue, which is um, when people buy affordable housing through programs, it should be deemed affordable in perpetuity. That person should not be able to go into the market at some later date. So there's two reasons people buy homes. One is to have control of their housing, knowing that nobody can ever kick them out, the ability to uh, renovate the home to their liking. And that's one reason. And the other reason is as an investment. Now, if somebody wants an investment that may go up and probably won't go down, they should stay in the regular market. And that's, that's fair enough. But if somebody doesn't care about this as an investment, they just want to have the security of knowing that they have a home, these are the programs for them because they're not going to make a killing on the, on the, uh, when they exit the, the deal, when they sell the property, but they're going to be able to get their money back at least. And whatever um, formula is created to uh, make it fair and yet uh, rising with the market in a reasonable way, but not these extreme uh, costs uh, increases. I had just been speaking with the uh, real estate board here. Yes. And I brought up to them the idea about equity sharing, that the landowner and the people doing the construction could be partners in the deal over time to allow it to be even more affordable to more families. I'm hoping that uh, we can combine some of these ideas and have a program that's going to work for more and more of our people, because the word affordable is such a joke. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as one friend said to me, this is uh, affordable housing is an evergreen issue. You know, candidates in the last decades have been talking about it and candidates in the future will talk about it, but talking isn't creating. And so again, some of these issues are out of our control because they're national, but some of them are local and we need to really double down on those. So I'm going to do, that's going to be my number one top priority as a legislator is affordable housing. Gotcha. What, um, what about education? I mean, I see that, I don't know, because I haven't really been looking where our education stands to uh, things nationally, but I know a lot of people have uh, said that the quality of education in public schools here is why they put their kids in private schools. Um, go ahead. Absolutely. I agree that education is, is dismal here. Now, I used to work at the Hawaii State Legislature. I worked in 2009 and 2011, and I worked for the chair of the Housing Committee, Rita Cabanella. And um, I could look out the window of our office onto the education building, and it was this humongous building. And I thought, what are all those people doing about regarding um, schools that they can't even visually see or drive to. I mean, I, I definitely do not approve of the state run uh, school district. Now there may be certain things that are uh, more efficient to do at the state level, but there absolutely needs to be districts. And I would say probably uh, based on counties. So there would be the Maui County School District. And that, uh, body that a department would um, be looking at the actual on the ground conditions in Maui, the actual on the ground needs of Maui students. So that's one thing. The other thing is I do um, the general overall philosophy of the education, public education is not, uh, I don't agree with. Um, I believe in whole child education. Uh, so that would be, you know, the sports, bring back the arts. They're not unimportant. Arts are important. It's not just about creating art. It's about developing the brain yeah. such that it can be, um, there's uh, objective and subjective. And our culture is only valuing one aspect, which is logic, which I also uh, think that they need to start teaching critical thinking. Because if there was critical thinking, people would not be um, uh, victims of propaganda. Propaganda is rampant in our culture, in our, from our government in many different places. And if people have critical thinking, they'll see, well, A 
plus B equals C and you can't make it D, et cetera. But, but they will see logically better. So logic. But on the other hand, humans need the subjective. And that's what art is good for. Art is good for accessing the unconscious and expressing it. And even if the person never does anything with art, it's just important for their development as a human being. So I don't see the public schools radically changing in the near future. So because of that, I support a voucher system where parents could get a voucher for the amount of money that the um, school district is getting for that child and be able to use that at either a private school or a charter school uh, so that there would be actual competition. There needs to be competition so that parents can actually see what school, um, and I'm not a big fan of this whole testing thing. I think there's so much more to uh, education than these, these tests. But that anyway, that parents could decide this is my philosophy or other parents would want a religious education. Other parents would want, you know, like a, a creative arts education. Some parents and, and some kids would do well with a science and math focus. So I think there should be uh, more choice. And again, that is the, the whole underpinning of my platform is freedom of choice that we are all adults and we should be able to decide our life, our education, our children's education and not the government. So that's my uh, opinion on education. Gotcha. You know, when I think about stuff, I always think about as you're growing up, you get to a spot and where are the opportunities? I'll give you why I'm asking that. I went over to Maui Community College and I thought as a senior, I would explore education systems that could make older people more productive and somehow be in a workplace that would carry uh, more than just local. And when I went through and saw the college, they don't have career paths mapped out. When you get out and you go to the career development, it's like, we have all kinds of jobs available. Hotel one, hotel two, you could be a, a bus boy, you can work in culinary, how are we going to give our future diversification if we don't have career paths being somehow trained to, to see where our world is and getting people more involved in things that go past our shores? I don't know how to do it. Have you, have you seen any movement in the education area? Maybe, I don't know if you have, toward uh, developing paths to be able to show these people what to do with all this education they get. I mean, that's my biggest thing. When I went to the college, I thought, well, why are you teaching all these things when you give them nowhere to be able to use them and incorporate them into their lives? How are we going to keep people on Maui, bring them back here when we don't have anything to, to do with this? We are not developing those kind of things. Do you have any thoughts on that stuff? How to get the education system I guess you'd say to get with it, that the world is changing bigger than just education that is in a box. At the end of that, you have that bunch of education, but now what do you do with it? Right. And I, is, your question was a, a combination of education and a diversified economy. Yeah. So um, one, um, one opportunity for a diversified economy is an ocean research center, ocean or ocean mammal research center. So that would be something that would be a good uh, economic driver. It would bring in uh, scientists, it would bring in uh, grants, uh, possibly federal grants, and it would give a place, it's a, an extremely relevant uh, skill set for Maui youth. And so those who wanted to go into marine biology, instead of having to go somewhere else with that degree, they could stay here on Maui and uh, work in that center. And that center possibly would uh, collaborate with the Maui Ocean Center and um, with uh, UH Maui. So that would be one uh, possibility. Um, I haven't studied the, um, the uh, course catalog of UH Maui, uh, I've looked at, there are definitely different courses. There isn't just hotel, there's uh, 
you know, I well, was there's looking, courses, but once you get that education, there's nothing what? you do with it. Right. And, and I, I'm saying. Like, for example, now in our day with computer and all these things, the, there's a whole world in the world of animation, in the world of creating product for the web, for delivery to people all over the world. But there's no education of when you get that information, how to plug into that. That's what I'm saying. There's, that's the part. So I the, haven't looked. Yeah, I, I haven't. I haven't had experience with the um, career counseling of the UH Maui. So I, I don't know. Now I'm, ba I'm going backward. In other words, I hear you. I use the college as an example because I myself, I went there to try to create a new major, a new thing, to, so that older people would have a career path. But I found that that bridge of how to take those skills and move them into the workplace was needed. And now I go backwards to high school, maybe even junior high school. Years ago, believe it or not, when I was in junior high school, they said, so what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And we took all kinds of tests and all kinds of things, but they never really shared the how-to career path move. So especially here in Maui, where general aptitude education i think needs to be in, in my experience needs to be increased and like you say critical thinking the ability what art teaches you and what science teaches you and how they're different but then once you have this education what do you do with it i'm hoping we have a career development path that can somehow integrate what you're learning with a way to use it in our community to help develop our economy here and to develop things that can work while here in other places. Uh, that's the area of education that I think has been missing at all the grade levels, that there's no real connection with the real work place. And, and I think that's an excellent point. And I, I don't have any specifics, but I'll absolutely keep that in mind well, uh, yeah. when, when I'm, uh, you know, talking to educators and when I'm, you know, in the position, but I don't know any exact things, but I agree with you, a uh, career counseling, and that's not like a big, big change, big, big deal. Oh. It would be just a career counseling uh, class in these different places. So, but I agree with you, there needs to be more of an integration between what uh, kids or young people are learning and how that can be used. So I agree that would be a good thing. Good. See that? Now, you know, this is a very funny show in that I'm a candidate too, which is probably a bit unusual for some, but that's the way it goes. No one has really stepped up. Can you imagine all of us running in the primary, like you say, and who are these people? Yeah, I have seven in my race. You have a race with probably just a couple, right? Yeah, there's, uh, I have one opponent in the primary. And then there are two Democratic uh, candidates. And then uh, whoever wins my primary, I'm hoping it's me, will go right. against that person. So there's four people all together. Right. Well, you can with imagine- varying degrees of involvement. And the public, when they watch these uh, little things with three minutes, three minutes of candidate, and then they go to the next, by the time they're an hour and a half into it, and they haven't gotten to the races that are there <laughs> yet. It's just been really funny. All these years, I always wondered why it wasn't really clear that it's during the primary. We need to know who the people are more to be able to come out with two good choices to move forward. Um, and, and that's another thing I've noticed in my political career is people way underestimate the importance of the primary. Uh, that's when, you know, half the people are, are more than half the people are kicked out of the race. And so it's really important if you care to vote in the primary. If you care about who's elected and who represents you, please vote in the primary. Right. Um, do you, when you think about issues, do people come up to you and express their concerns, anything that you'd like to note? Well, I have been going door to door. And uh, pretty much people mention, uh, like you said, traffic, uh, affordable housing, uh, the economy in general. Um, one a father wanted uh, to make sure his child didn't have to wear a mask at school. Um, 
and uh, yeah, education. Well, so pretty much the topics, traffic, pretty much the topics we've discussed. It's pretty, there's not a ton of topics. It's the, the ones that we've discussed are so glaring and the issues are so problematic that pretty much everybody's noticing them. Can you imagine what we've been talking about them before they were critical and now they're at critical? And so well, if you yeah. don't address the problem, it just gets worse. It just gets worse. Just now, the other mean. thing that's interesting is some of the questionnaires have asked about corruption and it talked about transparency. But I don't think transparency is the problem. I think money is. People, I mean, transparent, what are you going to do? Put you know cameras in the bathrooms? I mean, people, legislators will talk to each other. Legislators will talk to constituents. That's just happens. It's the money is the problem. And I've been saying this for a long, many, many, actually over decades, is that many times the campaign funding system is legal bribery. It's legal. One time I worked, when I worked for Rep Rita Cabanilla, the office manager, uh, somebody, uh, a lobbyist came in and said, I'd like to talk to the rep. And he said, oh, well, you have to donate money for her to talk to you. And he got in big trouble. But the reason he got in big trouble is not because that's how things happen, is because he said it out loud. You're supposed to not say it. It's supposed to be that, you know, Corporation X gives 2,000 or I guess her Senate race 4,000. And then a week later comes in and tells the rep or the senator, or the governor, what their uh, policy desires are, and then those magically get put forward. One time I was at a campaign fundraising event in Oahu, this was probably 10 years ago, and I was sitting at a table with a bunch of house reps, and they all said, if somebody gave me $100, it wouldn't affect my vote. But if somebody gave me $1,000, it would. And they all admitted it. It wasn't on camera or anything, but I heard it. And so the, if, if Hawaii is serious, okay, so we do have partial public funding, which is certainly a good thing. And I will definitely be participating in that program. That only gives 3,800 max. Well, 3,800, they match it. So 38 times two is 76. 7,600 for the primary and then you can get another uh, 3,800 uh, for the uh, general. So that's a little over 10,000. Well, that's not enough to win a race. And so there needs to be complete public funding. And there are many jurisdictions who have done it. And the way you do it is that each candidate, like for instance, now when I'm running for office, in order to file my papers to become a candidate, I have to get 15 legitimate signatures. You have to get more because some people moved or whatever. Now, with the partial, with the complete uh, public funding, the way it would work is the candidate would get maybe 100 signatures, and then one program said plus $5 each. And then what that would prove is that that person has public support. Then that person would get a debit card worth the amount of money that the last winning candidate earned or, or raised. So these aren't exact parameters, but just to give an idea that there is a way to give money to legitimate candidates that do have public support so that they're not beholden to anyone. As long as people are beholden to anyone, no amount of transparency is gonna stop anything because people can always get off camera and talk about things. So it's money in the elections that uh, that is causing the corruption and it's not going to change until that changes and all this you know frittering and band-aids isn't going to make any difference well i really like the fact that you have very clear ideas i mean and your experience about that um when you have three thousand bills and you've got to reduce it to 300 bills i guess money can push things a lot you know um, we saw a couple of examples that were glaring in our media over this last year of people that were well respected that suddenly you know money changed their career i mean and you'd yeah. think you'd think why do they need money why are they taking money and put out their whole career up 
in the spot like this when they've done so much good work. It's a tough area. I'm, I really think that one really needs to be looked at strongly. Thank you for your recommendation. I think that's a good and, thing. Um, and then the thing regarding, like for instance, the state house uh, salary is $68,000. That is enough to very skimpily uh, get by. And on the other hand, the state rep is only required to work full time during uh, the legislative session. So a little over four months in the spring, uh, January through April or early May. And the rest of the time, they are free to allocate their time as they wish. For instance, I think it would be quite easy to do part-time work or if you have a business or like, for instance, in my case, I'm a consultant, no, there's no hours set for me to do that. And then additionally, uh, do things to help the district but the actual session isn't in session. So there are ways, what I'm saying is that uh, for, this, for the representatives that only work during the session for the senators and this uh, house reps, there is actually time to have other uh, income producing activities. So they don't, they're not scrambling for money. They're not strapped for money. So they don't have to resort to uh, corrupt ways of getting money. What do you think we're going to do here? I mean, Kihei is a, an area that has that long road right next to the water that is a main artery, Kihei Road. Um, with sea level rising and all the changes, um, how do you think we're going to stop people from building on the shore, or are we? Well, I mean, there's zoning code. It's not like anybody can do anything without permission. Um, but yes, there, for instance, one um, building that I agree, I heard another candidate mention it, and I agree with that, is the, um, the new Hilton, the one where it used to be uh, the Maui Lu. Uh, they put, they built a building literally on the sand. I mean, it's on the sand. It's right next to, you know, it's the ocean, uh, Makai side of the of South Kihei Road. I've never, I haven't seen anything like that happening. Um, but apparently uh, there was a building there before and the county allowed them to put it there again. Um, I'm not gonna make any speculation on if that was a different and less wealthy owner, if the same outcome would have happened, but it's certainly something that needs to be uh, investigated. So uh, people, there are properties that are um, on the ocean and, and those lots have existed uh, for decades. Um, and those lots are stringently controlled. So it's not like anybody, like I know a, a property where there's one corn, there, the, the um, homeowner uh, rebuilt the house that was already there meaning the same footprint. He just left the footprint and he, um, seriously renovated it. And now the uh, county is saying that there's this one little corner of the house, four feet for like six foot long, like this little corner that he needs to demolish. Now the amount of dust that demolishing that takes, they say we'll use best practices. Well, you can only use best practices to a certain degree, but dust is created when you demolish. That's just a fact of life. And so the demolishing of that will create more dust that will go into the ocean than just leaving it there. And again, that was part of the original footprint. So, but I agree with you that sea level rise is a real problem because on my daily walk um, that I, I live on Halama Street. So my daily walk from uh, where I cut uh, like a block down all the way down to, um, I think it's called Waipualani Park, also Maui Sunset Park, I call it. Um, I see places where I can no longer walk on the actual beach and I have to go up to the, to the land above it. And, and then there's, you know, palm trees falling down. There's undercutting of where there's a lawn. I mean, the ocean is absolutely encroaching on the shore right near me. And it's, it's, it's what's happening. So um, I think, and the county knows that, and they do have uh, uh, oceanographers or ocean biologists working. There's one that is employed by the state but sits in the county. And so they do have professionals on hand 
to um, make advice and make um, uh, suggestions uh, regarding how to address that. So, but it definitely needs to continue to be uh, addressed, but that's already in the, in the um, process. So there are, are already doing that. What I was saying really was thinking when I talked about Kihei Road, I, you're right, is I'm thinking that we almost like need to create a main artery more uphill and more uphill the, there we have that highway with the roundabout so that's one road but we're going to need another road there's that liloa l-i-l-o-a yeah yeah which is a little yeah. section that's going to be somewhat of a reliever a little bit higher up but i'm just wondering how and what we're going to do with kia it's almost like how do you change a place that is so it is so down on the ocean edge. What's I mean, the, to, to, to create another artery that is in par, you know, here's South Kihei Road and here's the Pi'ilani Highway. To create an, a road that goes in the middle when there's a lot of homes, I, I don't think that's possible. That's um, why I'm thinking of what are we going to do? I'm, I'm really looking. I don't expect a candidate, believe me. A candidate isn't coming in as a guru who has all the answers and can suddenly apply it. We know it's all a, a group thing, and I'm not really looking that you have all the answers. I'm just really right, wondering right. and speculating about what we're going to do, because Kihei is built all along the ocean, and here comes the ocean, and more and more and more, we've lost sections of road down there. Um, how, I'm just wondering, how do we make it enough of a priority at a state level that we need another artery created? Well, you can't, because then you have to kick people out of their houses. It's not about funding, it's about people own homes. Oh, and, you're talking about between the two. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking like we talk about behind the high school. It seems like the whole- Oh, you mean way are, above. I'm trying to figure out how are we gonna deal? There is no way to really, like you say, eminent domain, take out a bunch of houses. No, that'd be wrong thoroughfare. and unnecessarily. Right. Yeah. But um, we have a problem here. That's why I'm looking. You know, if, if you have a resort area and you have one road going in and out with a, I, the roundabout is just there. So I'm picking on it. But well, it needs to be picked on. We um, need to think about this way before, way before that road is completely destroyed. So I just wondered what we can do. And how well, will we. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact answer to that, but one thing I do know is if there's a flood or a fire or a tsunami or some kind of emergency, there's only one exit out of Kihei. And there's, I mean, there's the Pilani Highway, and then there's the Mokalele going straight to Kahului, and then there's going all the way up the Hanoa Pilani if you want to go to Wailuku. But there needs to be another uh, road now I've I, heard I think I brought I think I brought it up really because I've heard people say there was a road plan connecting Pukalani and all the way across right now Highly it's minded. not a priority and no, now that would be a priority it, even, I mean there's for for normal uh, commute reasons uh, just so people that work up there or have family up there uh, can get there easily but it's also for emergency egress reasons that we need to, I will absolutely prioritize making the road uh, to a high Miley uh, A access road for all. Now, as far as the road up to Keokea, that is called Oprah's Road, I'm sure there's a lot of politics around that. So I'd have to research that. But the one to Haile Miley, I, I don't think there's any, you know, buddy, any individual owning it. So I definitely support um, more egress roads out of Kihei for safety and for commuters. And that's why I really, I brought it up because I, I like to think that over the horizon, looking in the future, a long way in the future is really important before it's biting us like the housing problem. And yeah. it's just impossible to imagine that we're not going to have problems if we don't make that other road a priority somehow. I mean, and the, the Pigliani Highway was fine before the roundabout or before the, the construction happened. I mean, it was fine. Now, granted, I don't always walk it or drive at total rush hour, but I, I've come home from Kahalui during rush hour 
And it, it's not a big deal. It wasn't a problem. So I think, frankly, the state bungled the high school. They bungled it. They, they, they created a problem that did not exist. Yeah, we need a high school, but we don't. And then the other question I have is, are they going to require all students to be picked up by parents or drive themselves? Or are they going to provide bus service? Because if, you know, hundreds and hundreds of parents all have to, you know, take time out of their day and go pick up their children at school, that's going to create a, a nightmare. So when I was a child, there was buses and kids could take buses to school. Yeah. So I know they have some, but it's pretty, I think it's minimal. But the other thing is right now, those kids are having to go all the way to Maui High. And that's, that's really, you know, that's across the island. But a bus that goes around Kihei and picks up students every morning and takes them home in the afternoon, absolutely needs, I don't know if that's part of the plan, but it absolutely needs to be. So we don't have a parent uh, created uh, nightmare there. Yeah. What other issues do you think that you'd like to discuss with the public or what things about you do you want to um, share? Because when I, like I said, I, I've seen you over time and I can tell even as I'm listening to you, you really are listening. You're very much on it. Not everybody that I interview is quite the same sharp tool that you are. You're sharp and aware and real, I can see you're looking for the problem to solve it. You just a problem. So I guess that's what you do. That's your yeah. job. Well, one, other, one other issue that I wanted to talk about is ocean, uh, clean oceans. Uh, currently, there is, the Kihei Wastewater Treatment Plant is injecting treated sewage. So it's treated, but not sterilized. So it's treated, they inject it in plumes under the ground, and then it goes with the groundwater. It, grabs onto the little stream of gra uh, groundwater and goes straight into the ocean. What that has done is that Cove Park is the epicenter of that. And so it, uh, Cove Park has the highest turbidity. Turbidity means inability to see a distance in the water. So the water is murky. And then the other problem is nutrients, nitrogen. Now, all of you gardeners know that nitrogen is a great thing to grow plants. Well, it also grows seaweed, it also grows um, algae, and it destroys the coral. So we do not need nutrients in our ocean, just save them and use them for plants. Now there's two different pilot projects that are being done on Maui as we speak. One of them is being done by a gentleman named John up at the Kihei Wastewater Treatment Plant near right next to it with vetiver plants. And these are plants, they kind of look like water reeds. And then they've got these huge um, root masses. And then those root masses can suck out all of the toxins and poisons and pharmaceuticals and all the things that we do not want to go in the ocean. So that's one uh, project that's being uh, piloted right now. The other is Dr. Lauren Pang, the director of public health, is doing a pilot project called vermin filtration. And that's using worms to eat sewage. Now he's doing it in upcountry for the uh, individual wastewater treatments, i.e. you know, the, land, the properties that currently have a cesspool, they need to upgrade to a septic tank. A septic tank is like $30,000. A vermin filtration unit is $1,000. So way cheaper, but it's also sustainable. With a septic tank, you still have to come and pump it. And then it, the sewage still has to be disposed. With vermifiltration, the whole job is done on site and the worms are more than happy to do it. Now that's the individual wastewater treatment, but it can also be done at a community level. So there are jurisdictions such as India, um, Haiti that are doing a vermifiltration at a community wastewater uh, level. So my goal is to give um, support to those programs and then to make sure that uh, the best one or combination, sometimes it's a combination is used to replace our outdated, expensive and not very efficient uh, wastewater treatment system. I mean, they're saying that to pump all the 
the uh, treated sewage out two miles, which would make it not a problem, would be billions. So why don't we just use nature? Because nature's got this down. Nature knows how to create, destroy, create. It's a cycle of life. And so if we follow nature, we're going to be in a much better uh, position with our wastewater treatment. And we'll have cleaner oceans. That's for swimming, for wildlife, for beauty, for everything. Well, that's a great thing. I wish I had heard about that before. I think public awareness of that system, uh, is it to a point where they can say it works enough and we can do it instead of replacing the- uh, I'm not sure exactly where they are in the- um, guidance. Well, in the, in the vermin filtration, I know he's not ready for prime time basically, but as the Department of Health, um, Dr. Pang, they, he can, or I don't know if he has to go through a committee, uh, make that legal for Maui homeowners. That's that one we're just waiting for Maui homeowners to legally be able to use those systems instead of replacing their cesspool with a septic tank. Now That's with the exciting. vetiver, huh? That's exciting. Yeah. And with the vetiver. That he's working on it and then now he wants to expand it. And uh, like I said, that one is uh, located uh, right close by the wastewater treatment plant. So I don't know the actual plans there, but he is in collaboration and communication with them. So that's on process. And vetiver has been used as a windbreak in the Central Valley in the farming. So it's, it's oh, nice okay. to hear that things have, you know, multiple applications with the same. Yes. Who would yes. have known that? You know, so like, many plants have so much. And that's how humans operated prior to the pharmaceutical industry. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of natural medicine also, whenever uh, appropriate. So I think that should be legal and accessible so that people have that option. Well, it sounds like you are a wealth of ideas. And um, um, I'm pretty well thinking you've made it pretty clear who you are. You're running for District 11 State House. And... Your major issues are the ones we all know, housing, education, our economy, the ocean, and uh, making a better ocean. Am I missing anything that really? Well, just general freedom. You know, I, I respect uh, the voters I and who will become hopefully my constituents. I respect people's ability to make choices for their life and their family, their children. And so I, um, I think that government is here to support the citizenry, to be a referee in certain situations, but not to um, dictate uh, how we live our personal lives. And that is uh, become an issue in our country. So that's another thing um, that I really support is autonomy and freedom of choice for life and our bodies especially our bodies belong to us not the government it's not up to them to make decisions for us so well, yes yeah. oh sorry go no go ahead so so yes i'm running for state house south maui district 11 of south maui so kihei wailea mckenna uh the primary will so we're, we're doing all mail-in ballots this year and so that means that everybody will get a ballot in the mail and the ballot, the primary will have different um, uh, sections. There's the, there's the nonpartisan races. Everybody votes the same in that section. Then there's Democrat, Republican, Green, et cetera. So make sure that you only vote in one of those. Um, now I'm running in the Republican primary. And uh, so if you're gonna vote for me, please vote in that. And then you have to, the, the other uh, seats in that are the governor and then um, the Senate district, uh, South and West Maui. So you only have to, you know, uh, restrict yourself in those three races. And um, but then obviously in the general election, you just vote for whoever you want, because there's going to be only two candidates for every race, or unless there's only one. Right. Well, you've been a terrific guest. I um... I just want to give in a breath here in case there's something that you think is really important that you'd want to add. Anything I'm leaving out? Anything that you 
would like to be able to share before we leave? No, I think I think just that it's really, really important to vote. I know a lot of people don't vote. They feel like it doesn't make a difference and um, it doesn't make as much of a difference as I would like. But I think, again, the problem is the uh, campaign funding system. That is the problem that many candidates are then. Uh, but I but still, it does make a difference. And and especially the primaries, I mean, literally like 2000 people vote, voted in the uh, Kihei primary, the last one I run in. That's like a high school or large high school. So it's not a lot of people. So because of that, your vote really, it's not like California where they have like 100,000 people in a, in a district. No, the, these are small. Everything here is small. So your vote actually has a whole lot more power than in these large states. So your vote really does make a difference. So please vote in the primary, vote in the general election. And you know, like you're doing now, listening to this video, educate yourself on what the values and policies of the candidates are. And listen also to the candidates themselves, not the party. The party is just some kind of general idea, but many candidates, especially now, uh, with everything kind of up in, up in the air. Many of the candidates are, agree with certain things. Like for me, I agree with certain things in the Republican party and certain things in the Democratic party, but I'm still me. You know, all of you who have known me all these years, I still have the same uh, progressive values. And there's just a couple of things that the Republican party, uh, like less government involvement in our personal life that I agree with. And so that's why I'm running as a Republican. But make sure you vote for the candidate, not the party. I'm with you. Natra, you've been a terrific guest. I very much appreciate you taking the time out to spend with me. And um, I hope that everyone out there realizes that how important they are in this process. It is, you know, all this stuff doesn't go anywhere without you. Get out there and vote. And, and thank you, Jason, for, for hosting this uh, candidate forum. It's a, a wonderful public service. Thank you. Well, everyone out there, I hope that you enjoyed this show and you can watch it again at MauiNeutralZone.com. Netra Halpern, District 11, State House. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for hosting, Jason. Take Aloha. care, everyone. Aloha.